And so this Sunday, we now go into the meaning of Easter, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He spent three days in the grave. You can argue as much as you want that he didn't spend a full three 24-hour periods in the grave. But according to the Jewish customs at the time, he was laid in the grave before nightfall. He spent the next day in the grave, and then he was raised after the, th the third day had begun. So he spent three days in the grave. So we want to talk about the benefits of his resurrection. Let me say that the first one is the defeat of death. I find this, and if you'll turn with me once again to John 11, you'll see this very popular, well-known passage, one verse, 1125, that says this. He's talking to Martha. She has a sister named Mary, and Jesus loves these folks, and they have a dead brother named Lazarus who died four days prior to this. Jesus did take his time getting there, and Martha was saying, oh, if only you did, he would not have died. And so he says this to her when she asks, you know, I know that he will be raised again at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Cheating death is a hobby of Americans, those at least who take it seriously. Uh, some of us who are chubby don't necessarily do anything about cheating death. But some of you are probably fitness fanatics. Some of you probably eat very, very well, good diets, Many of us take medicines that hopefully will prolong our lives and cheat death. So it is a national pastime. And so whether we are exercising or dieting or taking the right medicines, we're trying to live as long as we can. It's desirable for us to do so. So we're trying to cheat death. But inevitably, death comes to all of us. And so we might be able to last longer, but we're still going to have to face that moment. We can't defeat death, but Jesus can. I am the resurrection of life. Even though you die, you live. And if you're living, you don't ever have to die. That's basically what he's saying. He's saying death doesn't have to have the last word in any of our lives. It doesn't have to be the final moment for any of us. Now, he's not denying that we're all going to die. He knows he's going to face death before the week is over. He knows Lazarus has been he's about to raise him from the dead, by the way. And so he knows death is inevitable for all of us. So he's not saying that you'll never die. He's simply saying that death won't have its grip upon you when you do die. That death won't be the end of it for you if you should choose to believe in him. Nor is he promising that we'll live without ever dying. Many people would say, I can't do my taxes. And so we take our taxes to the tax man to do our taxes. Many people say, I can't fix my own car, but we'll take our car to somebody who knows how to fix it. Many people will say, I can't cook, so they'll get married. <laughs> And the point is this, taxes can be avoided, cannot be avoided, so we go to somebody to fix them. Cars have to be repaired because we need them, and somebody has to cook in order for us to eat. And likewise, death is unavoidable, and it would be wise for us to go to one who can fix that situation for us, who has the ability, the power to overcome our deaths. And that's someone who's made that bold claim, and nobody else has, is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, Jesus is saying two things literally. If you believe in me and you die, you will live after you die. But if you're currently alive and you believe in me, you'll never have to suffer the consequences of your death because you will live forever with me. Now, the statement in John chapter 11 has two understandings. He's talking, first of all, there's life after death. Even though you die, you shall live. And he's also talking about spiritual rebirth. That even though you're alive, you will never have to face death. See, he's on one hand promising that even though you die physically, you're going to live forever. And on the other hand, he says, if you're alive and you believe in me, guess what? I'm going to cause you to live forever spiritually. You'll be born again, as he told Nicodemus some chapters before this. So the benefit is physical. Your body's going to be raised from the grave. And the benefit is spiritual. Your life can be changed right now. And you never have to suffer death as it was intended through sin. That's what he says to Martha. And Martha was asked the question at the end of verse 26. Do you believe this? That's really the only way to benefit from his resurrection is to answer the question. Do you believe this? Not intellectually. I grew up believing this all my life. It wasn't until the age of 31 that I finally understood how much I needed it. 
believe this. And as Martha said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. So the first benefit of his resurrection for anyone who would believe is the feet of death. The second benefit, found in Romans chapter 4, verse 22, a fantastic book. We are studying this, by the way, on Wednesday nights. We're only halfway through. If you wish to join us, we'd love to have you. But Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says this. He was delivered over to death for our sins. That's what we talked about last week. And was raised to life for our justification. Now that word justification is an important Christian word. But it's a word oftentimes is misunderstood so often by not only us, but by preachers in the pulpit. So how can I make this simple? He says it's for our justification, not for his, for us. And so what this means is that all that was necessary for us to be declared righteous, not guilty, acquitted before the judgment seat of God has been done in Christ's death and in his resurrection. Everything we need to be able to stand before Almighty God upon our own death and to be ushered into his presence forever into heaven has been done and accomplished by Jesus Christ our Lord, by his death and by his resurrection. His death satisfies God's punishment for our sins. That's radical. None of you would like to stand in the place of a rapist or a murderer and take their punishment, spend life in, in prison or executed for, your, for this person's uh, crime. Jesus did that for us. And God in the end is basically saying through justification that I accept you. When he is able to say and look at you and say, yeah, you believed in my son, therefore I accept you. He's saying, I'm declaring you righteous through my son. I'm declaring you not guilty through my son. And I'm declaring you acquitted through my son. Not that you've never done anything, but he's saying, I'm looking past all that because my son paid for your sin. Now, how do we understand this in our own terms? In the legal profession, it's called expungement. When you are charged with a crime, oftentimes if it's your first crime, and it's not so heinous like rape and murder, you can go and serve your time, you can do your community service, you can do whatever the probation officer and the judge agree you should do, and the judge will say, if you do all these things in two years, I'm going to clear your record. Now, I have a lawyer here who knows much more than I, but I believe that's pretty accurate. Expungement. I'm going to clean your record. No employer can look into it. No spouse can call up and say, before I marry this guy, has he ever had a criminal record? Uh, there, is, there is a sense there that it's wiped clean. And you've been given a second chance. In some sense, justification is saying the same thing. The difference is that there's not good behavior that's going to wipe away our sins. It's Jesus Christ dying on our behalf that can expunge our prior record. And allow us to be able to stand in front of God and all of society declared righteous, innocent, not guilty, acquitted, <coughs> cleansed, free. So that's how we need to understand this justification issue. And that is the only way that God will accept us. By the way, it's oftentimes the only way society will accept somebody who's committed a crime is if their record has been expunged. <laughs> so the only people who can be justified are sinners. Please hear that. The only people who need justification are those of us who have made mistakes against God. And in the end, that includes us all. And so the only ones who need justification is all of mankind. Every one of us needs to be expunged of our prior record. And the only way that that can be done is by the one who stood in our place before the judge and took our punishment. Have you benefited from that? Do you believe today that if you died, you'd be accepted by God based on what you've done or based on what Christ has done for you? Answer that question as we get ready to sing and worship again. Because the next benefit I'm going to talk about is derived from this. And that is if you believe Jesus' resurrection defeated death for you, and if you believe his resurrection will allow you to be accepted by God, then in the end you can live as if you have hope. You don't have to shake. You don't have to fear. Because Christ has done it all. And God has put the exclamation point upon his life by raising him from the dead and say it has been finished.